If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 10. Today, we're starting a four-week series called Parables. Uh, parables are stories Jesus taught to teach deep truths. Some parables, when you read them, it's pretty obvious. Some parables, when you read them, it's kind of head scratchers until Jesus kind of interprets what he means in that parable. But all of these parables are used to really deep teach, tr teach deep truths to our lives. And to, God uses these uh, parables to really solidify his truth into our lives. Uh, you know, we, we, when we look at these parables, uh, many of them we know because we were taught them in Sunday school. But today we're going to look at parables, uh, at the deeper meaning of these parables and make sure that we don't get so caught up in the story that we lose the meaning of the parable. When we look at these parables, Jesus is giving us practical examples of how to live our lives as Christ followers. And many times when we talk about our faith, we talk about what we believe. Yeah, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe these things. But the truth is, how you live is a better indicator of what you believe than what you say you believe. Because what we believe truly is expressed by the way that we live. And Jesus is going to give us some examples about what it looks like to be a Christ follower, how we should live our lives, and that, that uh, the way we live our lives really indicates what we truly believe. Today, we're going to look at a story that's familiar with most of us. It's the Good Samaritan. And what I want to do is I want to read the story, make a few comments as we read it, and then for us to come back and make an application of this parable to our lives. So if you have, if you have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 10, I want to start in verse 25. <clears throat> it says, Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I'm a teacher at heart, so I could spend 30 minutes on this one verse. So we're going to run through it real quick. First thing is when you hear, when you read this and hear uh, an expert in the law, don't think of lawyer like we think of today. This was a biblical scholar. This was somebody who knew the first five books of the Old Testament, the Old Testament law, so well that, that they taught it and, and they, they were the expert in the laws of the Jews. Now understand that in the first five books of the Old Testament that the Jews had come up with 613 laws that you were to keep to be a good Jew that they found in the first five books of the Old Testament. This person knew all 613 of the laws and was an expert in those laws and could tell people how to keep those laws. So he stood up, and it says he stood up to test Jesus. So immediately we know his motivation. His motivation is not out of true desire to, to learn. It's not really to to gain knowledge from Jesus. He's really trying to find a way to hold something against Jesus. So he's going to ask a question uh, that, um, that hopefully he could come back and use against Jesus. See, the religious leaders had major problem with Jesus for a couple reasons. Number one, Jesus hung out with people that they would deem weren't worthy of hanging out with. In fact, how many times do we read where Jesus hung around with sinners and he hung out with the people that the religious leaders had written off or, or never was even on their radar? They wouldn't even think about these people. And so he's going to test Jesus by asking these examples. And secondly, Jesus is the leader of this movement and Jesus doesn't keep the laws the way they think that a good Jew ought to keep the law. So they have a major problem with Jesus, and he's testing Jesus. And then he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Anybody see a problem with that? You see, we get inheritance not based on something we do, but we get inheritance based on a relationship. You have a relationship with somebody, you inherit because of that relationship. Really what this, this uh, religious leader is saying what must I do to earn eternal life? 
He's really asking that because for this religious leader, it was all about keeping the rules, about keeping the law. And he wanted to know, what should I do? What law should I keep so that I know that I get eternal life? We know that there's nothing you can do to get eternal life except put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's something he's already done that we submit to that brings eternal life, but he was a religious Jewish leader who really believed you earned your way into heaven. So Jesus answered him, and Jesus, being a great teacher, answered the question with a question. And he says, okay, you're the expert. What's written in the law? He asked, how do you read it? Now, the religious leader gives an answer here that's really unique. First of all, the first part of it you would expect him to give. The religious leader says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. He's quoting Deuteronomy 6.5. It was well known. It was, in fact, it was part of their daily prayer as they prayed the Shema. They would pray Deuteronomy 6 5. And that was a standard answer. But then this religious leader does something that we don't find anywhere in Scripture up to this point. What he did is he hooked another section onto the Shema and he said, Oh, and also your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. We don't know where he got that from because there, that is found in Leviticus, not in Deuteronomy. And, and the thinking is maybe what this religious leader did is they took the, the Ten Commandments and they said, okay, the first four really deal with loving God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. But the other six really deal with loving each other. And so he put those two together. And Jesus answered him and said, you've answered correctly. In fact, later on, a religious leader is going to come to Jesus and say, what's the greatest of all the commandments? And Jesus is going to answer with this same answer that this religious leader gave. He's going to say, here it is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets can be summed up into these two commandments. Jesus said, man, you want to know what the whole Old Testament's about? Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. I once heard somebody say, they were asked, what does it mean to be a good Christian? How do you live your Christian faith in, in, a, you know, in a way that pleases God? And the answer this person gave was this. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and then do whatever you want to. Why did he answer that way? Because if you do love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then you will desire to live for him and your actions will be pleasing to God and in alignment with God's will. But this was a religious leader that was looking for legalistic answers. He was an expert of the law. Now, my job this morning is to make us all just a little bit uncomfortable. That's my job this morning. As I was been working through these parables the last several months, it's like, oh man, do I really live this the way that Jesus wants me to? And, and since I've been living with, un, with an unease, I want you to share with that with me, okay? So here's the thing. If you're over 50 in here, my guess is if you grew up in church, you grew up in a church like I did because it was a part of the culture when I was growing up. And that is this, that churches focused far more on what you did than who you were. Now, it was just a part of the culture. Here's what we were taught. If you're a good Christian, here's the things you do and here's the things you don't do. And you remember all of those rules, right? You don't smoke. You don't drink. You don't chew. You don't hang out with people who do, right? You, you don't go to R-rated movies. Man, it really blew up when The Passion of the Christ came out, right? And what do you do with that if, you're, if you grew up with all these rules? But, but really, in the churches we grew up in, they were great churches. It was just a part of the culture that we focused more on keeping the rules than we did on building a relationship with God through Christ. So much so that if, think about this, when, when your focus is on rule keeping, it doesn't lead to life and joy. When your focus is on rule keeping, it leads to judgmentalism. It leads um, to really uh, 
cantankerousness. I mean, it's some of the most, you know, miserable cantankerous people I know kept the rules really good. Uh, of all the rules, they never drank, they never smoked, they never, you know, all of that. In fact, I remember being a business meeting one time, and one person who who was really looked on as somebody in the church who who really kept all the rules. They spoke, and and, and they were just mean. And I thought that person needs a drink. That's what that person needs, right? They need to break a couple rules, all right, and, and chill a little bit. Uh, and and so this religious leader, because he was based everything on keeping the rules. He was so judgmental, and yet he knew the answer. He knew the right answer. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. And Jesus said, hey man, you've answered correctly. And he told him, do this and you will live. The religious leader should have just walked away right there. But notice what he does, verse 29, but wanting to justify himself. That's what rule keepers do. They want to be able to justify themselves. He asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, he wasn't asking that question out of curiosity. He had already defined who his neighbor was. A good Jew would define their neighbor as another Jew who was keeping the law. For a Jew in that day, the, the neighbor was not somebody geographically close to you. It was somebody who culturally was like you. So it wasn't even just Jews. It was Jews who were practicing their faith and keeping the law. That's who their neighbor was. Anybody outside of that who wasn't a part of the chosen people, they would look down on and they would really see those people as insignificant and not even worthy of their time. And so this religious leader says, and who is my neighbor? So Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. Now, when you hear this, he was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He is literally going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Throw the next picture up here. Many of you have been to Israel with me, and, and there is a road to Jericho uh, from Jerusalem. It goes over the Mount of Olives, and it drops over 3,000 feet in about 14 miles. In fact, when we go to Jericho, throw the next one up there, when we go to Jericho, we're 800 feet below sea level. And there are times when you're in Jericho and you're in short sleeves. You go up to Jerusalem, you have a sweater or a coat on because the elevation is so different. But this picture also shows you that there are places on the road to Jericho because it's going through these uh, canyons down 3,000 feet, where you don't know what's happening right around the corner. It was a dangerous road. Robbers used to hung out, hang out on this road, and, and they would attack people. You would never take this road at night. And so Jesus starts this parable by saying that uh, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. Now he goes on to say, a priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, to the original hearer, here's what they would make as far as the connection. If the priest was leaving Jerusalem, taking this road down to Jericho, what that meant was that the priest had been in Jerusalem putting in his two weeks of service at the temple. A priest would rotate and serve at the temple, and so they would immediately make this connection. He's been at the temple, he's put in his two weeks, and now he's heading home, either Jericho or somewhere along the River Jordan, a little bit north of there, so he's on his way home. He sees this man on the side of the road. You would think of all the people to stop and help, it would be the priest. He would be the hero of the story. But it says that when he saw the man, he went on the other side of the road and passed by. Why would he do that? Well, in, in the Jewish faith, if you came in contact with a dead body, you were unclean for seven days. And so I got to believe that this priest said, okay, it's not my job because if I touch him and he's dead, then I can't serve for the next seven days. But the truth is, he'd just served two weeks in Jerusalem. 
on his way home, he was probably going home with his family. If he was ceremonially unclean to serve, that wasn't going to be an issue. That wasn't going to be a big deal. Even if he was going to a synagogue, he was still going to be okay for, to not work for a few days. So here's what he was doing. He was using his religion as an excuse not to get involved in this man's life. He justified his actions through his religion to not get involved in this, in this uh, man's life. And then we keep going, and it says that in the same way a Levite, when he passed at the place and saw him, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed on the other side. A Levite was somebody who worked in the temple. Again, he's worked at the temple. He's on his way home. He looks. He's under the same laws that if the man is dead, he can't work for seven days. And he makes an economic decision. If I touch him, I might not be able to work. And so financially, I can't get involved in this person's life. Then we keep going. Then Jesus said, but a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. Now, you got to understand, Jesus has just changed everything in this discussion. He has just made a Samaritan the hero of the story. And if we can't really appreciate what was going on there between the, the fact that the Samaritans and the Jews really had a disdain and hate for each other. And I thought, how, how can we understand this a little bit better? Well, imagine being in the Deep South in the 60s when the racial tension was at the height. And imagine that there's a, a group of pastors having breakfast at a local cafe somewhere in, in southern Alabama. And, and these men shouldn't be pastors because they're a part of the problem and the racial divide, and, they're, uh, and they've got you know, issues, and, and they're racist, and, and Jesus walks into the cafe. They see Jesus, they say, hey, Jesus, come over, have breakfast with us. Jesus sits down with them, and man, they, they start to say, oh, you should have seen yesterday. Man, I preached my heart out, things were awesome, yada, yada, yada. Jesus then stops and says, wait, wait, time out, guys. Let me just tell you this, you know, Brother so-and-so, and he mentions the name of the local black church in town. He slayed it yesterday. Man, he preached us such a message. That church was on fire. They, they're just, I mean, if God was looking down in any church this weekend, he was saying, man, that's where it's at. Now imagine what those racist pastors would be feeling for Jesus to make that man the hero of the story. Well, that's kind of the tension that's going on here with this religious leader. And, and, and he's looking and going, thinking, how could you make a Samaritan the hero of this story? And so Jesus then goes on to say, but a Samaritan on his journey came up to this man, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took two denarii, or, or two days' worth of wages, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. In other words, here's my credit card. Keep it open. Charge whatever you need to. I'll take care of it. Look at verse 36. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Verse 37. The religious leader answers, the one who showed mercy to him, he said. Now, you may think that his heart was broken, and he says this out of compassion, but here's what the text kind of indicates. He's saying it in disgust. Notice he can't even say it was the Samaritan who was the hero of the story. All he could say was and acknowledge, well, the one who showed mercy to him. Then Jesus turned to this religious leader, and he said, go and do the same. And that's what Jesus is calling every one of us to do in this parable, is to go and do the same, and to, to do what the Samaritan do, did, and that is to have compassion on those who are in need. 
And so let's go to our notes for just a minute and fill in some blanks real quick. What is Jesus ultimately telling us to do in this? Well, we would say it this way. He's calling us to be the church. He's calling us to be the church. You see, when we say go out and be the church, what we're saying is to live out this great commandment, to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And the first thing we're called to do is to love God. And that's exactly what this religious leader answered. But it's what Jesus said later was the greatest commandment. And yet this parable is about the second part of it, and that is to love people. When we say to be the church, we want to love God, we want to love people. I didn't put in there to love your neighbor, I put in there to love people because if we're not careful, we can fall into the same trap that this relig religious leader did when we start talking about our neighbors. You see, when we think of neighbors, if we're not careful, we can think of people who are like us. People who share the same faith, the same values as we do. The kind of people we'd like to go to lunch with and hang out with. And many times that's kind of how we think of neighbor. Jesus has blown up that definition in this parable. And he said a neighbor is anybody who is in need. Anybody that God brings across your path, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their socioeconomic uh, status, regardless of their religion, regardless of their morality, they are your neighbor if God has brought them along your path. And so when we say that we want to be the church, what we're saying is that we want to unleash thousands of people every weekend to go out and to be good Samaritans. And to look for opportunities to show compassion and to show love to those around us. You know, this church has always had uh, a reputation for being somewhat generous. But we got really intentional about this in the last year. And we're going to open up a dream center. And, and the dream center is to live this out and, and to show compassion and love to an under-resourced part of our mission field. But what this parable is really teaching us is that every one of us should be dream centers when we go out that we're there to minister in Jesus' name and, and, and to bring healing and to, to be a part of what God wants to do to infuse his love in the world around us. And so since this is a story about showing compassion and providing, let's use that example and look at four ways to be the kind of neighbor that God calls us to be. In your notes, the first thing to be the kind of neighbor God wants us to be is we have to put humility over pride. Humility over pride. The religious leader asked those questions not out of humble seeking. He asked those out of prideful judgmentalism trying to find a way to trap Jesus. It was pride that led him to ask those questions. And we are to humbly serve God, humbly serve others. In fact, Philippians 2, 3, Paul says this, in humility, consider others as more important than yourself. Do you hear what he just said? In humility, consider others. Who are those others? Anybody God puts in your path. In humility, consider others as more important than yourself. Don't look only onto your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Here would be maybe as good of a gauge as I can give on whether we serve in humility or whether we serve in pride. What happens when you pull up to the, to the red light and the guy comes between the cars and he's got the sign? If your first thought is, dude, just get a job, that's pride. If your thought is, man, if you quit drinking and doing drugs, you'd be okay. That's pride. Because you have no idea what put that person there. Humility says, but for the grace of God, there go I. And God, how do you want me to minister here? Doesn't mean we give every time we ask the Holy Spirit to lead us. But that's a pretty good indicator whether we're 
working out of pride or humility. And the first step, if we're truly going to be the neighbor God calls us to, we must look at the world through humble eyes and not prideful eyes. The second, the religious leader put pride over humility. The second is we have to put relationships over religion. The priest was all about religion, so much so that he missed an opportunity to minister to somebody in need. You know, I've already mentioned this. There's this joke as Christians that we don't swear, drink, or chew, or hang out with people who do. That really describes religion. And the reason religious leaders had a problem with Jesus is because he hung out with those who smoked, drank, and chewed. And God wants us to use us to bring the gospel to everybody and to show compassion to everyone. And we understand that, that, yes, there are some things that the Bible is very clear. We don't do these things. And if we're Christ followers, we stay away from these things. But it's not about keeping the rules. It's about honoring God in a relationship. And then it's about ministering to God by ministering to others and showing compassion to others. And in that way, we're showing love to God. The third is to choose generosity over security. The Levite made an economic decision not to get involved in this man's life. But we're to be generous. We're to be generous of our time, our talents, and our treasures. And we see the Samaritan taking the time to bandage the man's wounds, to put him on his donkey, to bring him to an inn, and to pay for his care. It was costly. But Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, don't find your security in the treasures on earth. He said, on earth, moth and rust destroy. Translation, it's temporary. The stuff here on earth is temporary. He says, moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. What's he saying? You could lose it all tomorrow. He says, instead, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. How do you do that? By being generous here on earth, that that's true security. And then lastly, choose love over safety. That's what the Samaritan did. He took a risk. If this man had been beaten up, what's to say if he stopped to help him, the robbers weren't still around and they were going to beat him up. But love takes risks. And when I think about Samaritans in our church, and I could give dozens of examples, but I think about those who are foster parents in our church that they choose to love a child that's not theirs biologically, and that's a risk. And they take that child into their home, and here's what you know, when their foster child comes in, many times they have an attitude, and many times it's hard to love them. But they choose to do that, even though that child may reject their love. But let's say they make a breakthrough, and man, they've really connected with that child, and we've seen this so many times at our church and those who are fostering. And man, they've made a breakthrough and they're seeing great progress in this child. Sometimes it seems that at the time when things are going great, that's when the state steps in and says, hey, we're going to place him back with his original family or, or they're going back and they're going to be adopted and they're taken out of the home. Foster parents know that they're going to be hurt before they ever go into it. But they choose to love anyway, knowing that their love is going to be costly and knowing it's going to be tough. That's what God calls us to do, to love and to choose love over safety. So let me finish with the way Jesus did. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to a man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The religious leader said, the one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus said, go and do the same. Let's pray. Father, that really is an indicator of our relationship with you. That God, we truly are humbled by your love for us and the ways that you just extravagantly have shown your love. And that God, we see our life as a ministry, as a mission. And a part of that is to show compassion to those who are hurting, those who, Lord, this world has beaten up and have lost hope. And you've called us to bring the hope of the gospel. You've called us to sacrifice financially to help others in need. 
And God, I pray that we would look at this story and we would identify far more with the Samaritan than the religious leader or the priest or the Levite, that we would choose love over anything else, that you would use us to make a difference for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.